All right. Welcome to ASRG Worldwide Webinars. I apologize for the delay here, but we've had a little bit of a problem with the the YouTube link. Well, I wish the YouTube guys would tell me when it goes live automatically, but in any case, um, it's time for the ASRG Worldwide Webinar. So bringing you the latest research, innovation, and education. My name is John Heldreth. I am the founder of Automotive Security Research Group, and we have a great presentation for you tonight. First of all, as I said, my name is John Heldreth, founder of Automotive Security Research Group, or ASRG for short. Um, I've worked in the automotive industry for the last 15 years or so now and focus my time on product security or vehicle security now. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan in the U.S. of A, but today I'm living in Germany and working for Porsche Engineering. Please feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or other social media platforms. Just quickly, the, the Automotive Security Research Group is a nonprofit company focusing on the advancement of the automotive security industry. This is a community to support the coming together of two areas of competencies, the IT security market and the automotive market. This is a community for you, for the automotive engineer, for the IT security specialist, for the beginner, the hobbyist, the you know, even for those people that are probably not even in the right webinar. But this this is a community of volunteers. Our entire organization is built on the volunteer efforts of the administrative team, and of course, people like yourself. We are trying to remove the boundaries that can occur in the automotive security industry. This could be communication, borders, finding different ways to learn, different solutions, um, anything. Because at the end of the day, we all have the same goals. And this is to keep our customers, which are, this is our family, our friends, um, data safe and secure which can only be achieved together. If you want to get more involved, if you want to make an impact on the industry, maybe start your own ASRG location or participate in a technical committee, be a part of a project, just reach out to us. You, know, you can find more information about ASRG at www.asrg.io or send us an email at hello at asrg.io. Just quickly, as a summary, every week we give you a little bit of an update about what's going on in ASRG. I'm very um, proud and uh, excited to announce two new locations at ASRG. This is the location in Paris, so France, way to be and in Stockholm, Sweden. So guys, um, two major additions to the ASRG family. Thank you for uh, contacting ASRG, saying we want ASRG in our city and becoming a part of the family, a part of the movement, a part of the idea. So really welcome to ASRG Paris and Stockholm, if you're listening tonight. Um, just as a summary, we have, I think it's around 5,600 members. I can never keep the amount straight. It doesn't matter. As long as you guys continue finding that this is bringing value to you, we will continue doing it. Um, but around 5,600 members currently, 34 locations worldwide, 18 different countries. Um, if you guys wanna get more involved, if you want to have your own ASRG location so you can get in contact with the people around you doing the same stuff, please send us an email, get in contact with us. Um, all the links are in the, the YouTube description for Slack, for email, whatever you need. Just get in contact with us. 
Um, your city is not too small. It's uh, it's always a possibility to meet new people, get involved in your community. So um, ASRG has been very successful with webinars. Ever since uh, Corona and COVID has kept us inside and trying to protect our health, um, we have we moved over from presence, so face to face meetings, into webinars, right? And it's been really nice. Everybody has really enjoyed these things. Um, we have webinars booked until the middle of next year, twenty twenty one. So, um. Please check back with ASRG about what's coming up. Just quickly to give you a summary about what's going on in the next few weeks. November 12th, we have Modern Fuzzing for Automotive Software. And Sergey Desch Deschand is going to be giving us that talk. November 19th, Automotive Product Security from an Attacker's Perspective. Rafael Boycarpi uh, from Riskure is going to be giving that talk. Um, November 26th, uh, we have planned Argus to be with us. We'll see what the title is and who's going to be giving that talk. It's not a secret. It's just not decided yet. Uh, and then we have December 3rd, 2020. Um, we're going to be talking about this new regulation, VP29, as seen through real life cyber attacks. Um, and Alan Kunar, who actually was the first presenter of ASRG webinars, will be back with us. He's coming from Upstream. Really great presentation. So please check back. Um, always, we have webinars until the middle of next year. So uh, it's going to be really interesting what's coming up. So without further ado... I would really like, I have this pleasure to introduce all of the presenters, and um, this one is, like always, um, we have a great presentation for you today. Um, hold on one second. We have a great presentation for you today. Um, Arnaud Gardon um, from Moabi is going to be giving the 29th presentation that we've had at ASRG in less than a year. And he's going to be talking about um, assessing and improving supplier's product quality in a car program. So um, if you guys do have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat window. And we will ask Arnaud at the end of the presentation um, about all of these different questions or clarifications that you have. Um, no problem, type them in the chat window. He'll be happy to answer them later. So without further ado, Arnaud Gardon from Moabi. Arnaud, it's, it's all yours, sir. Uh, our product. And of course, this process to, to improve suppliers' product security in a car program. So I'm Arnaud Gardin. I'm heading the innovation and, and partnership for Moabi. And I am with PTO uh, to present you uh, this uh, solution. So just a few words about Moabi. So first, Moabi is the story of a, security, of a security research analyst who have worked together since 10 years. Uh, our CTO, Jonathan, uh, delivered multiple talks at DEF CON and Black Hat, some of them about the first hardware and software backdoors in 2012, or about exploits against BitLocker or Windows 10. Um, a second founder, uh, Nicolas Massaviol has been working in the automotive industry in the last eight years, uh, delivering audits and, and pen test activities. So during this last 10 years, the team of founders developed various tools for pen test, for product security and red teams to be more efficient and relevant in their mission. So two years ago, they integrated these various tools into a single platform, 
Moabi. And the company Moabi was created then to market and sell uh, and sell it to the various industry. Uh, our platform, and we are proud of this, has been rapidly identified as a key innovation in the French cybersecurity ecosystem and recently in Switzerland. Uh, we contribute to the ecosystem, for instance, with uh, the IIC for the Industrial Internet Consortium to bring some cybersecurity insights, especially for automation and robots uh, for the Industry 4.0. And uh, we are proud to count multiple customers uh, in the automotive industry in the defense industry and in the oil and gas. So our first customer is from the automotive industry, a French OEM. And this presentation is a summary of this live use case. We are not allowed to name it, but no wonder you can identify it rapidly. The first part is dedicated to position the problem that we want to solve. Uh, this is the challenge to check suppliers' product security. In the second part, we will focus on the solution itself and how it works. And the third part will present the impacts and benefits of the proposed solution for this OEM. Finally, we will have a short solution demo before jumping to the conclusion. So what is at stake? So in our audience today, you are many experts, and this is a very simple statement you can have every day. New, connect, new connected car programs are more and more complex to secure. First, you have a high number and a wide variety of UCEs, ECUs to verify. Depending on the type of vehicle, you may have more than 100 ECUs to view and analyze. Looking ahead, the autonomous vehicle will also bring completely new architecture and complexity. Some of these UC ECUs are critical from a safety and security standpoint, such as brakes. Some of them are extremely exposed because of connectivity. Think about IVI or IVC. So on top of these ECUs, hundreds of different management applications exist and with the ECU's program it represents thousands of software, hundreds of thousands of different binaries and millions of lines of code. The second complexity um, it results from the supply chain itself with the cascade of suppliers. For a given OEM, you can have more than 50 different first rank suppliers with hundreds of second rank suppliers and thousands of different subcontractors in total, which may contribute to the different software applications. In a nutshell, thousands of different software with thousands of different suppliers. Despite the current and new upcoming standards, such as uh, ISO 214434, we all know that cybersecurity maturity and cybersecurity quality are very diverse as well. In a car program, and let's take an example of a specific ECU. Once again, this is a real case for from a, a recent car program. So this program lasts three years between initial specs with security requirements and product and the final car launch uh, with the availability of this car. The initial step, of course, is the setup of specifications and your security requirements. For this given UCU, the first release from the vendor happens after six months. Then a new release is, avail is available every th six weeks. On the other side, the OEM security team has access to the release notes and has to do initial validation of the enforcement of the security requirements. 
integrity and respond to supplier with various feedbacks, recommendation of change and need for new details. So basically, this is a race. So the challenges are very simple. You have very few expo experts to cope with all releases and ECUs. You have very short time to do some event test. And a critical point, you are not able to perform this relevant test until the ECU is really operational. And it's very late in the process, often in the last six months. So important issues may not be seen early, whereas they may require a lot of work, uh, a lot of rework and modifications. And basically, as you are at the end of the program, pressure raises considerably to be on time and new security considerations can be overlooked before the initial launch. So delay is not an option. So looking at your supplier's product security, how can you check that cybersecurity best practice and standards are implemented? Today, you have more or less three different approaches to do that. The first solution is to perform source code analysis. Static application security testing are good for such an assessment, as long as you have the source code. And it's rarely the case. Many components may come from subcontractors. There are a lot of legal implication to protect inte intellectual property of your supplier. And another important point, the source code is not the final deliverable and you don't see the impact of the compilers, the linking with external libraries, etc. So the second solution does rely on questionnaire or paper audits of your supplier. It may be a self-diagnosis or it can be performed by a third-party auditor. The pitfall is that most of the time it focuses on process and real security assessment is delegated to your supplier. And this may be biased, unfortunately. As the saying goes, proof of the pudding is in the eating. The third solutions rely on OEM auditors, pen, test, pen testers and security analysts, basically most of you. Because of the number of assessment to be made, this effort is concentrated on specific samples, initial suspicions, and it's extremely time consuming. Sometimes making sure that a required change has been in force between two releases may require several checks during several releases. So few critical flows may focus all the attention while new ones will be overlooked. So as you can see, current solutions do have their specific limits in terms of scalability, objective assessment, and intellectual property protection. So let's come back to this OEM. It has decided to work with Moabi. Let's see how we can help them and how we help them. So Moabi is a platform to assess the cybersecurity level of any product, any software binaries. So the platform is based on a powerful technology of automated reverse engineering. It supports multiple type of architecture, so such as Intel R32, Arch64, MIPS, etc. And it provides automated security audits in few hours at scale. It can be deployed as an appliance in a data center, in your data center, or as a service in a public or a private cloud. In fact, you just have to upload software binaries. There is no configuration. Whether these binaries are coming from application, firmware, or operating systems. 
the analysis will start automatically and in few minutes or few hours, depending on the number of binaries, you are going to get full audit with analytics and several met metrics covering different cybersecurity criteria with detailed remediation reports. So at the end of the day, you have a solution to track cybersecurity level and benchmark different releases of the same software or two different solutions from two different suppliers to compare their specific security levels and security gaps. So we've been talking about reverse engineering. Let's get into the, this, uh, this view. If you look at current state of the art, you have different flavors of reverse engineering. So you probably know Idapro, Ghidra, Binary Ninja, etc. They do support multiple architectures and it works on binary. However, they are not product security focus. They are offensive focus, 100%. They require high level of expertise to be used. And it does not scale for what we want to achieve to secure a connected vehicle. You may analyze one binary or two binaries a day per user. A second solution is linked to the academic research. You have different tools such as CLI, SAT solvers, SMT solvers, Z3 for symbolic execution. The good thing is that it proves the existence of bugs and vulnerabilities hard to trigger. However, these are still offensive solutions that do not scale and still require source code. You will have a, a presentation soon about fuzzing, so I, I don't want to go into the details, but this very good solution to prevent false positive. But once again, they are 100% offensive focus and they have somewhat uh, a, a very little coverage. So Moabi on the other side has been designed right from the start to be 100% defensive, so for product security purpose. It scales to industry needs. Uh, for instance, we have some software analyzed with 40,000 different binaries. Uh, they have been analyzed in alpha day. So it's a blend of disassembly, decompilation and symbolic execution. On top of this, we have added different features for process integration like REST API and risk analysis. So we are in the reverse engineering area. You may wonder if there is any intellectual property issue. The point about Moabi is that we only focus on cybersecurity criteria. We are not trying to rebuild the source code. Uh, and remember that, for instance, in Europe, in the copyright protection law, reverse engineering is authorized for interoperability and security. And you may remember as well that, for instance, reverse engineering is used more and more by antivirus. So, Moabi assessment is here to cover the first step of SSDLC from requirements and design up to verification and release. And our audits are based on five different metrics and cybersecurity criteria. Let's review them. The first one is legacy. The point is to measure the technical depth of the software. Is this software uh, for a recent architecture or a recent operating system? What are the compilation date? Is the tool chain with compiler and linker recent? The second metric is hardening. As you all know, in the last 10 to 15 years, compilers have done huge progress to limit the attack surface of memory 
SLR, stack cookies, WXRX, et cetera, et cetera, are very important features to be activated during the compilation phases for better defense in depth. And this cybersecurity criteria will track this. The third metric is about the use of cryptography. With privacy by design in mind and GDPR, we need to make sure that strong ciphers are used. If your supplier still use DES, it means a lot about a cybersecurity maturity. The, four metric, the fourth metric is linked to compliance to security standards. So basically, Moabi analyzes API function calls to, to see if this function should be deprecated or not according to security standards, such as POSIX, MSDN API, Dalvik, or else. The, the platform, Moabi platform, has ingested 44 different standards. And last but not least, the last criteria is vulnerability. And we have two ways to assess vulnerability. First, we do track current CVEs pre present in the binaries. Obviously, a long list of CVEs is not a good sign. And Moabi leverages as well symbolic execution and taint analysis in order to, to detect potential zero days. And this is what we've done for this OEM. On top of this uh, SSDLC metrics, we have two qualitative analyses to identify binaries with deliberate obfuscation. You may understand that if there is a deliberate obfuscation, it's because it may be because it's a malware or maybe because it's for an IP protection. The point is to be able to identify this right from the start, right from the audit. The second risk analysis is linked to the binaries and the privilege of these binaries. Da do these binaries have any specific access route, admin access, or network connectivity? It's very important in, in order to identify this to, so, so that we, we know exactly what are the most critical binaries among the thousand of binaries, for instance, for an IVI. And this critical binaries should be prioritized for rapid remediation. So let's have a look at the, the results for this OEM program or this preliminary results for this OEM program. So first, it was decided to focus on the most exposed ECUs. The first ECU was the IVI with 10,000 different binaries and the IVC, so the, the modem. And the objective was to target uh, the most exposed ECUs with a high number of binaries and multiple releases. Just an example about the IVI. Uh, for this uh, OEM, you have very diverse versions between countries. For instance, the IVI was open in China, and whereas it was super locked in the UK. And due to that complexity, it was extremely important for this OEM to track evolution and security improvements. So on the right-hand side, you can see a comparison between two releases of a subset of the IVI. So each binary of this IVI has a security score based on the five metrics from zero to 100. Any issue, bug, weakness, flow, or vulnerability decrement the security score. So in blue, you have a group of binaries 
uh, with distribution of their uh, global security score. And you see in five seconds, you can see that the orange version, uh, the orange group of binaries has a better security, is closer to 100% than the blue one. It's a view, very, a very simple view to compare the cybersecurity level of two different releases. So here are a few results and findings from the analysis of these two UCU. The initial result was linked to the technical depth. Of course, we start uh, by the architecture and with the tool chain. And with this, in, in this uh, program, the supplier had to update his tool chain, especially to update the compiler. And with the new compiler, initially it, it was six years old. With the new compiler, all defense in depth functions could be activated for all binaries, reducing automatically the attack surface of these ECUs. Second point, Moabi was able to spot different obsolete functions in the API calls. And the functions were replaced step-by-step step in the different release. Then known CVEs could be identified and even zero days were detected, for instance, in OSTAPD. So the qualitative analysis were extremely useful so there was no issue with deliberate obfuscation. So no potential malware anywhere in the binaries. And the risk analysis for critical binaries enabled to drill down rapidly to some limited number of binaries for urgent remediations. On the right hand side, you, we give you a view of, of OSTAPD uh, a binary present in, in Wi-Fi hotspot uh, embedded in most vehicles with the defense surface we discovered uh, based on the five metrics. So the benefits for the security team is um, you have multiple benefits for the security teams. First, for each release, you just need to have six hours to analyze all binaries for IVI and IVC. With these metrics, you have stable and consistent results. You can follow up, benchmark the various releases. You can track the change. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to suppress any, you know, Excel spreadsheet, uh, but most of them uh, could disappear uh, during this, this program. For the security analysis, uh, the security analyst teams, you basically add multiple impact, positive impact and benefit. First, you can now focus on binaries with low metric. And so you can spot the needle in the ear stack very rapidly, which is quite an achievement. Second point, you have better qualification of these targets for in-depth analysis. In the reports, you have a lot of information and we will see some of them in the demo. You have a lot of information about all the binaries. So those who need extra work, uh, you will have already a good basis for further analysis. Last point, you can give feedback to suppliers right from the first release. You don't have to wait for the software to be executed or to operate uh, in, in, in full. You can give feedbacks right from the start, right from the initial static analysis. 
So let me move to a short view of the platform uh, to, to see one example of the Gen IVI that we have analyzed for this uh, presentation. So as you see, there is only one configuration. Uh, there is no configuration for this platform. You just have to upload any software, any binary, drag and drop your file, and that's it. Then you will obtain in a few hours the analysis of a full platform. So how does it look like? Here you probably know the open source Gen IVI platform. And here is the result of the analysis. So first you see that for this uh, distribution, we have 6,000 different reports corresponding to 6,000 different binaries. And here you have the distribution of the security score for all the binaries. So the closer from 100%, the better it is. We have set a, a, a KPI or performance objective at 75%. You can see that you have some delinquent binaries that should be uh, reviewed first. And you have a mean score of 87. So rapidly, after a few hours, you have already something to show either to your purchasing team, either to your supplier or to your security uh, colleagues. Now we can dig into the legacy and all the other metrics. In this software, view, you have a synthesis of all the, the issues or gaps we have identified for Gen IV. You see it's a 32 bits architecture. Of course, this is less secure than a 64 bits architecture. But what's more important is that you see some binaries have um, a very old compilation date, uh, very old compiler, etc. Even some tool chain uh, which dated back uh, 2003. From a cryptography standpoint, you see that DES is still used uh, and MD5, etc. And there are definitely weak ciphers that should not appear in, in new systems. From a compliance standpoint, so what we see at the IP, API level you see we have identified multiple functions that should be obsoleted because they are dangerous. So according to POSIX, USLIP should be replaced by NanoSLIP. It still exists in this software and in, different, in 65 different binaries. So the, the, the fourth metric we're going to see is hardening. So as you know, hardening is extremely important for to, to reduce the attack surface, uh, for the, especially for the memory. Here you can see that for this Gen IVI system, multiple features have not been activated. So full relocation, stack cookies 45, they are almost not activated. And you have then some exception for NX or safe uh, WXOX and ASLR. And the fifth metric here about CVEs, you see that in this a Gen IVI dated from 2017, you have less than 200 different CVEs. And you have here the list of CVEs and the list of impacted uh, binaries. And below that, we will have a look and see whether we have detected potential zero days. 
Let me check this. Yeah, potentially there are some buffer overflow. So this has been detected by our own algorithm and we should be, our security analyst should track and see what's going on in nano and what could be seen. Uh, what, what is the probability of such a zero day? So now you have more than uh, 6,000 different binaries. You can see that all binaries have a defense surface and using our filtering capability with criticality here, we, will, we can drill down and see if there are any issue, any binaries with vulnerabilities we can, we can go through. And here, you see that well, OpenSSL, I think it's an old OpenSSL version. Uh, you have a lot of uh, binaries with low, uh, low security score, low defensive face. Just to have a look at some details, to show you the level of details and what you can expect in order to go further into the analysis and the security of this binary to interact with your supplier. You see that you have a lot of information about the legacy. You have the CPE that was identified linked to open SSL, the ordering features that were not activated like 45 full railroad uh, and stack cookies. You have cryptography, so probably linked due to, to backward compatibility issues and vulnerabilities here, a lot of CVEs due to uh, the very old uh, version of OpenSSL. So basically this is it for, for the demo. It gives you um, some few information about what can be shared with your team and with your supplier. And we can move to the conclusion. So as John was saying in the introduction, cybersecurity is a team sport. It's a collective effort. Uh, working with suppliers is sometimes very tough and we have to share a common language. We have to share some common objectives and we, are, we have to be able to measure them. Uh, with our platform, we are able to create a framework to analyze product security. So not only you, you assess the security level, but you are able to share with them some KPI. And these KPI, they are here to work with suppliers and stimulate cybersecurity for improvement. It's a gap analysis, and we give the information to close the gap. You have the analysis in a few hours, you can communicate with all stakeholders, the purchasing team, the suppliers, the project management team. So this is very convenient, this is very efficient uh, for your communication about cybersecurity. And a very important point uh, as a final conclusion. We all know that cybersecurity expertise is very scarce. There are very few cybersecurity experts like you in the audience today. And you probably need more automate, uh, automation in order to help you focus on your risk, on risk analysis and on remediation priority, priorities. This is what we can do for you. And this OEM measured that we could help them to save up to 50 to 80% uh, of, of their task. And this is what we can do for, for this supplier assessment. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for ASRG and, 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 and John. And uh, I'll be glad to, to, to answer to your question now. Thank you.
Arnold, thank you very much for such a great presentation. Um, actually, I, I have a few questions myself, if you don't mind, first of all. Yes. Um, actually, it's really nice to see a, a product or a service that's um, that, where you can evaluate the software uh, without looking at the source code. And this, this for me is really important because of course, source code is intellectual property. And this usually needs to stay at the creator unless there's some kind of agreement beforehand. So this for me, really nice to see that we can reverse engineer and still maintain the quality of the, the product that we have software in, maintain the security of that product. So really nice. Um, I was, my first question is, can the product from Moabi um, evaluate parts of, um, parts of a firmware or parts of a um, binary, or does it need the complete thing? Uh, it does need, you, you just have to upload the complete binary so when when you say uh, part of the binary, what what do you mean exactly? Well, I take this, Arno. Uh, I take this. Uh, allow me to interject as uh, the CTO of Moabi. My name is Jonathan Brassard. Um, uh, to answer your question, John, uh, you don't have to have the binary up and running. Uh, that's one of the benefits of using static analysis as opposed to uh, a dynamic assessment. Um, the, the, the binary does not need to be like fully running. It doesn't have to be in its environment and it doesn't need to be configured. So you can do that a lot earlier than you could do like a dynamic analysis after doing a regular pen test. That's definitely one of the benefits uh, of using um, uh, static analysis. The other one being, the main one, being that you have 100% coverage, which never happens when you do dynamic analysis, right? If you're lucky enough, you get 5%. Um, uh, the benefit of doing a static analysis is that even dead code, even apps rich code, even exceptions and things like this get analyzed systematically. Okay. Uh, great. So that means that I can actually test code through my entire process, right? So if, if I'm just getting small snippets through the entire thing, um, yeah. We should be able to test it for the quality and watch that mature over time. That, that, that's, the, that's the mindset. Uh, my own background is in, in product security. I used to run a part of product security at Salesforce uh, in California. And uh, uh, our mindset is really to follow and improve a uh, secure development lifecycle. And the earlier you can, um, uh, detect problems in uh, the SSDLC, the more impactful you are. And there's no reason for us to, to wait until the car is shipped uh, to start detecting problems, right? Right. So that's really the mindset, you're right, uh, to try to detect as early as, as, as possible. And I worked through iterations. That's also very critical. Like, it's not a one off, it's not like taking a snapshot at a given time. Uh, what really aiming at is as a trend to improve processes over time. All right. No, thank you for the, the answer. It's really nice. Uh, I have a few other questions, but I let's let's jump over to questions from the audience. Um, so Scott Sharon is asking, um, does this work for AutoSAR applications as well? And if so, or also what CPU architectures does it support? That's a really great answer. I take that as well. Uh, so officially, we support uh, Intel ARM R64 CPUs. That's what we, because uh, if there is a bug in there, like we will fix it. And officially, we work with a lot more CPUs, uh, in particular smaller architectures. Uh, we have a lot of, of requests for microcontrollers and the components and things like this. If you have even exotic things like uh, MSP430 uh, firmware or something like uh, a Broadcom firmware, uh, 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 give it a try. 
anything in between, such as like, you know, Spark, MIPS, uh, RISC V, things like this. Unofficially, we do support all of them as well. The challenge is really um, um, at the core of, of Moabi is uh, a static analyzer that performs uh, symbolic imputation and uh, taint analysis. And to be able to do this, uh, one angle is to be able to transform um, uh, any given architecture's disassembly into an intermediate representation. And that's actually not too difficult. So what is difficult then is to understand the calling convention for every single CPU. And uh, this requires a bit of like uh, fine tuning of our engine. And uh, yeah, that's why we don't uh, officially advertise uh, uh, other architectures. Okay, so it's it's pretty flexible, yeah? That's the end goal, right? To have something <laughs> which is retargetable and, and it's gonna work with any given CPU. Uh, for the time being, like, yeah, uh, uh, we have a set of like support, officially supported architecture and, and unofficially, everything else is of interest and should work as well. Okay. Um, so, if you, allow me, if, you allow me just, if you allow me just an anecdote, we, we actually had a, a, I used to live in India myself uh, some time back uh, during my career. And uh, one of our friends from India was like, hey, uh, we know this supplier. Um, is doing uh, uh, meters, like park meters for cars. Uh, he does his own CPUs and he does uh, uh, his own firmware on top of it. So obviously he's not following any rule, right? He's not following any standards. Uh, he's doing his own uh, hardware architecture, which is very custom. And we think there is zero chance that that's gonna work in our platform, but let's give it a try anyway. And uh, obviously most tools like Gidra, or IDA were like, this is random stuff. We have no idea where the code or the data starts and, and, and we're not able to work. And Moabi was still able to detect uh, cryptographic problems. The reason for it being um, be able to detect cryptographic algorithms through uh, what we call uh, substitution tables or transfer tables or initialization tables. And those do not change uh, uh, across CPUs. Uh, Indianness matters, like the size of operands matter. So we were able to make up for this. And we're still able to uh, detect the use of death in this entirely alien custom built CPU. Which happens a fair bit actually, if you think about it uh, uh, in the car architecture, um, a fair bit of um, um, manufacturers uh, add their own instructions, which are custom and not understood by any standard compiler. So we have to make up for this complexity, this additional complexity, uh, when trying to come with a solution dedicated for um, 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 uh, connected car vehicles. Yeah, uh, fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you for the answer. Um, I, we have another question from the audience, and that is, um, you know, we all use these different types of software tool chains, right? Can can you explain to us what the difference is between something like um, Synopsys's Black Duck and what Moabi is offering? Yeah, uh, Black Duck is a great tool to try to uh, come up with a bit of material uh, and try to detect CDEs out of this. That's like half of what one metric of what Moabi does. So we do we do like five times more, or rather 10 times more than Black Duck. Uh, Black Duck is not able to do a uh, symbolic execution or taint analysis to find zero days. We are. Uh, Black Duck doesn't look at like uh, uh, computation problems like legacy problems or hardening problems or compliant problems. Uh, their focus is really to look at like just a narrow bit of like doing a bit of materials and potentially finding like a breach of compliance with um, uh, licenses. We'll try to find uh, um, um, defective software. Uh, and this definitely has some value. It's actually mandated uh, in the new uh, ISO standard 21434, uh, uh, which asks you to do a bit of material and be able to do uh, future proof uh, monitoring 
uh, of this bit of material. And that completely makes sense uh, when you, uh, you know, have an approach of trying to bring some maturity uh, to what I said, the process uh, of future proof. Uh, but in terms of finding zero days, that's not going to find zero days. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, I have one last question. Um, and you, you have to remember that I'm not a software expert here. So if this is the dumbest question on earth, just, you know, uh, be polite and, and <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. But um, uh, so if I'm uploading just... Um, is there a way to like trace back from the binary to the source code itself? Like if I'm looking for specific vulnerabilities in a certain section of my code, uh, a, as an example, if we're looking for like in the HSM, um, uh, the, the driver or the library that's actually working there with the HSM, and if we're trying to identify any vulnerabilities there, is there a way that we can trace back from the binary to that specific instance in the software codes itself? Um, That's a great question. Where we have that, the that, issue? That, Sorry. That, that's actually not a dumb question at all. It's actually, very, it's actually a very relevant question. Uh, uh, so the truth is, if you do have access to um, uh, the source code in the first place, and would like to still use Webby, which is a 100% uh, binary analyzer, uh, you can make a build, uh, which has what we call debug symbols, uh, in which it will, want to. it will tell you whenever we find a vulnerability in the binary, at which line of code uh, this binary was present. Uh, this is not a standard behavior. You have to do a, a custom build uh, for this to happen. Uh, to build with, uh, to enable what we call debug sections uh, in uh, the ELF file. And uh, as a matter of fact, we often see uh, people who ship such binaries by mistake in production, uh, meaning that um, you, you might know that normally when you do reverse engineering, you don't have access to things such as function names, you don't have access to like function parameters, and you certainly don't know at which line of code they were compiled. Uh, because this information is unnecessary for uh, the CPU to run or the kernel to run the binary, but they are embedded uh, in debug section. So if you do do a, a, a debug build, uh, certainly we will be able to uh, report this more accurate and uh, 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 debug full information as well. Okay, yeah, I think that's probably pretty important to, you know, make that traceability back from from this from the the binary Fair enough. to the yeah, source yeah, code can... where's the issue right you know the, the spirit of reverse engineering is to make the most of all the information that is present in the binary so in most cases this information is not there because in production the, the kernel uh, and the cpu do not make use of this information but if it's there, yeah, definitely. For a human being trying to debug and fix this information, of course, we're going to make use of it and report it. It's tremendously important and, and useful information. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to have to talk to you offline because I think I'm going to need uh, uh, to look at this more, more in detail. But um, I wanted yeah, to... Thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, to engage with the audience, and you know for the for the relevance of the questions, and you put us in a you know the next level of expectation. That was actually a great exercise for us as well. Great. Well, guys, thank you so much for the great uh, presentation and and working on a solution that actually you know is needed in the field. Um. So for everybody that's listening, if you want to get in contact with Moabi about um, their solution to reverse engineer software code and develop uh, quality metrics regarding security about your code, please get in contact with uh, Jonathan or, or Nal. Um, and guys, before we close, would you like to say anything? 
thanks for your time this evening. Thanks. This was yeah. great. Thanks, 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 John. Excellent opportunity. Great, guys. Uh, thank you from our side. We're always happy to have uh, new solutions here at ASRG. So. Thank you guys. Uh, for, thank you to all the, the people participating and, and watching today. Uh, please check back next week. We got another great presentation coming to you. So um, looking forward to that as well. All right. We'll see you next week. This is ASRG live webinars. Talk to you.